One of the cornerstones of special relativity is the Michelson-Morley experiment of 1887 to measure the movement of the Earth through the luminiferous aether, or movement of the Earth relative to an absolute reference frame. Unfortunately, their experiment and all those conceptually similar to it which followed in later decades were, one and all, logically flawed. These are not experiments at all. They fail to fulfill the logical requirements of scientific methodology, and the reason they fail is that these scientists did not and do not now understand the fundamentals of their craft. A modern experimental physicist understands the concept experiment only implicitly. He has no explicit logical definition of the term experiment to which he can refer for practical assistance. The blame must be laid at the feet of the philosophers of science who have completely failed in their appointed task. We have here a total meltdown of philosophical reflection. The definition and logical rules of any experiment are as follows. A state A exists. An operation is performed on state A, transforming it into state B. Both states A and B are compared to a standard X, which is not functionally attached to the experiment. In shorthand, A over X equals R times B over X wherein A and B are the states, X is the standard, and R is the result. That is, R is the difference that would transform B back into A. Let us now give an example of an acceptable and an unacceptable experiment. Suppose we have a metal bar, A, that we conjecture will shrink when put in the freezer, the operation of interest. We have another metal bar, X, identical to A, that we use for our standard of length. We then put A in the freezer and after a time take it out and compare it with X to measure the amount of shrinkage of A, now in state B, relative to the standard X. By noting the difference R, we have a quantitative measure of the operation done on A by the freezer. We may also have thermometers serving as standards of temperature to facilitate quantitative analysis for future experiments at different temperatures and with different metal bars, but our main standard here is for length. The foregoing is a valid experiment. Now let us redo the experiment as before, but instead of putting just the metal bar A in the freezer, we also put the other bar X in the freezer with A. Obviously, this is not a valid experiment because the standard of length x, essential to the measure of length, is now functionally attached to the experiment. Obviously, it will also shrink in the freezer, nullifying its logical use as a standard. In the case of Michelson-Morley, the sandstone slab on which the experimental apparatus rested functioned as the standard of length. It must be considered as the main standard of length because the experiment is meaningless unless the slab remains unaffected by the aether throughout its rotation in the pool of mercury. But as in the above case where the standard of length X is put in the freezer with the metal bar A, our standard of length is exposed to the aether wind by definition and it cannot be removed from the influence of the aether, and so cannot function as a logical standard with which to measure any possible change in the interference fringes expected by the experimenters. Because the standard of length is functionally attached to the experiment, the only possible result is either a null result, which was found, or a spurious result if the sandstone were to partially entrain the aether causing a difference. But the assumption of the experimenters was that the aether passed through everything without interaction, allowing the Earth to stay in its orbit at constant velocity. Clearly, the experimenters, Michelson and Morley, as well as all others who followed them, 
did not understand the fundamental rules of experimentation. Today, the failure of the philosophers of science continues unabated. Scores of scientists work on projects, such as those at CERN, where attempts are made to beat nature over the head with a cudgel, so as to extract answers. Inquiring minds want to know. CERN is an example of giantism, wherein projects in a decaying civilization are made ever bigger and ever more expensive to accomplish nothing at all. No answers are obtained. All that is gotten is more data. There is no one there to integrate that data into a consistent map of existence. It is as though they expect the data to self-integrate with no human input. But any understanding of nature must, by definition, be man-made, for nature never gives away its plan. It talks to no one directly. Sherlock Holmes obtains a handful of clues and manages to solve the mystery. Scientists, on the other hand, have obtained tens of thousands of clues, yet still no answer is forthcoming. This excess of clues, unprocessed, is analogous to constipation. Clearly, none of the problems of science are external. An intellectual laxative is needed. 